Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Cal Newport, welcome to the podcast. Ben, thanks for having me. We're excited to have you with us. Why don't we start by uh, reviewing the thesis of your New York Times bestseller that just came out, Digital Minimalism. Right. Well, Digital Minimalism is a philosophy of technology use that says, especially in your personal life, you should focus your time on a small number of tech that gives you big wins and to be happy missing out on everything else. So your personal life. So we're not talking about your nine to five day job. We're talking about all of your free time on the weekends and evenings. Yep. And so what is the problem that people have right now? What, and, and, and why do you feel pressed to uh, prescribe this solution? I mean, what I was hearing from people mainly in the last two years was this shift where before where maybe they had been self-deprecating and telling jokes like, hey, look at my phone too much or I'm, I'm addicted to this thing. It shifted about two years ago towards actual unease. And the ground on which I think this unease was built was not really about usefulness. So it wasn't what I'm doing on my phone is useless. I just wish I wasn't looking at my phone. It was really autonomy that was getting the people. It was this idea that I'm looking at these screens more than I know is useful, uh, more than I know is healthy to the exclusions of things I know for sure are more important. And I'm increasingly feeling manipulated, let's say emotionally or in terms of my beliefs as I'm looking at this. And so the issue was I'm losing my humanity here to some degree. I want to take back control. Now, you're no tech Luddite. You're actually a professor of computer science at Georgetown University. You've been blogging for years and years and years. Um, You use email, but you do not use social media. So what is the problem with Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, etc.? What's unique about this wave of technology that's created such a crisis in your eyes? Right. Well, there's not that there's something wrong with the core idea behind these services. You know, Facebook originally was just looking at Web 2.0 and saying it's a bit of a pain to learn WordPress. So like we could help you set up a blog and connect to other people, right? It makes a lot of sense. LinkedIn, we can do two degree networking, incredibly useful, right? Uh, Instagram, you want to share photos, we, we make it easier. Where they became problematic for a lot of people is when they began to re-engineer their experience. Uh, This was right around maybe 2011, 2012. Facebook really led the way where they re-engineered the experience from this more static web 2.0 experience of I post, you post, we look at each other's post, and into this incoming stream of social approval indicators. So now the whole experience was every time I tap on the icon on my phone, it's like pulling the slot machine handle. Did I get more likes? Oh, I didn't get likes this time, but maybe now I did. Let me go check. Or how did this thing stack up to this past thing? That re-engineering was in large part contrived to try to get us to look at the phone much, much more, which was uh, hugely lucrative to the companies because it massively increased the data points they had on users and massively increased the eyeball engagement. But it also created this model of constant companion smartphone use that I think is at the core of people's unease. That's what really got people to this point where they felt like I'm looking at this screen much, much more than I want to. So it's addictive? It's addictive, probably. Do you, do you use the word addiction? I know there's there's some sensitivity around that. I mean, are, are we addicted? Yeah. Are, there, are the properties of Facebook similar to people that have a, a drug a drug problem? Is that, is that what's happening in the brain? Well, so, so I got into it in the book because I was curious. So I talked to psychologists, looked at the literature. If you want to understand it properly, it's different, almost certainly different than a substance addiction, right? A substance addiction has actual chemicals that can go through the blood-brain barrier and directly interface with neurotransmitters, right? That's very powerful. You get very strong withdrawal effects, for example, when you leave something that you have a a substantial chemical addiction to, and it can cause lots of trouble. Most psychologists that were interested in behavioral addictions would say people's relationships with their phone is probably best described as what they would call a moderate behavioral addiction, which is much lighter than a substance addiction. What, What essentially you get, though, out of a moderate behavioral addiction is you will do something more than you know you should if you have access to it. So if I took Facebook away from you. I said, look, I'm a judge. I'm, I'm saying, you know, you're no longer allowed to use Facebook. I've, I've taken it off your phone. You would be okay. You, you weren't going to sneak out in the middle of the night and, and try to steal someone's Facebook account, right? But on the other hand, if you have Facebook in your pocket all day long, you might check it way more than you know you probably should. So it's similar to if I put the, the bowl of chips, you know, 
by your office every day, you're probably going to eat way more of those chips than you probably should because they're hyper palatable and you've built up some sort of behavioral uh, association with I eat chips at my office every day. But if I got rid of them, you're not going to sneak out to go to the, the corner deli. Yeah, it is. It's interesting because a lot of people know this to be true, but they just they can't help themselves, right? There yeah. is this real sense that yeah, I really I know so many people, myself included. I I really shouldn't be checking Facebook as much as uh, as I do. The problem is, is there's some real benefit, and you acknowledge this in the book. It's not that it's a hundred to zero. There, you know, maybe it's eighty twenty or or seventy thirty or fifty fifty, depending on your perspective. But there is real benefit that comes from using these services, right? You're staying in touch with loved ones in other parts of the world. Um, you're organizing with friends uh, to go out to a movie or whatever. You know, there's all sorts of quite benign ways that we use these services. And so because of that, we feel like we can't totally disconnect. And we at times do feel quite good about the usage. But then there's plenty of other minutes and hours and days and weeks eventually as they pile up when you're on these services that feels destructive. It feels it's just FOMO or it's inducing envy or guilt or you just don't feel very good about how you spent the last hour of your life when you put down the phone finally. But this blend of good and bad, right? Whereas when you look at other sort of vices, you don't look at the heroin addict and say, oh, well, there's some good that comes from that. Um, it's mostly bad, but look, there's some good. Uh, whereas it really is the case with Facebook, right? That there's a lot there's a lot to like about what it can bring to our life, but then there's a lot not to like. And that makes it a more complicated picture, doesn't it? Well, that's why I think minimalism is probably the appropriate philosophy to use here. It's, it's why you don't, I didn't call the book something like digital detox mm -hmm. or something like this, because minimalism, again, is an ancient philosophy. It's, it's been around forever and it's been applied fruitfully to all sorts of different parts of the human condition. But it's a really good fit for tech in our personal life because minimalism helps you deal with this issue of there's lots of things that offer some value. And and yet, like Marcus Aurelius used to talk about, you can be very dissatisfied with the role some of these things are playing in your life. And so the way minimalism helps us cut that Gordian knot is that it says, you need to leave behind a mindset that says, if something has some value, then I should probably use it. You need to leave behind that sort of loss aversion mindset that, that we have right now in our current culture, where if I'm not using something that could give me some value, it's like someone's taking that from me, right? Which is, which is our current mindset. And that's the, the maximalist mindset. Minimalism says, if you really want to maximize your quality of life, find the things that are really valuable. Focus on those. Miss out on the things that, not the things that are bad, but the things that are good, but just not that good. Right, so don't put fo don't put too much attention on things that are kind of good. Take that attention, reserve it to put on things that are really, really good. You end up net net actually better. And so it's actually a, a really clear approach to technology because what it says with technology is okay, great. Get in touch with what you're all about. What do you value? What do you actually want to spend your time doing? What makes a good life good in your estimation? And then for each of these things, you can step back and say, if there's a way to use tech that really helps one of these values, that's awesome. Let's do it. So let's dig in more to the word minimalism. You said minimal, minimalism has been around a long time. Yeah. And the, the decluttering movement uh, is at a, is probably at an all time high right now in terms yeah. of physical possessions due to, um, Marie Kondo and new, new, new Netflix show, which yeah. is being watched a lot in my house right now. Yes. Not by me. So I'm curious, what is that? What is the historical philosophy of minimalism in other parts of life? And then how does that port over to technology? Yeah. Well, again, as I mentioned before, it, it goes back to the ancients. You had the Stoics were very worried about allowing small value pursuits and possessions to crowd your time and attention away from the things that really matter. Thoreau got very quantitative about it, which is why I, I spend good time with Thoreau in the book. He was thinking about minimalism in terms of what you actually do with your productive work hours. And so Walden, which is, which is one of my favorite books, is often misunderstood as a nature book. But it really was a, a pretty quantitative and concrete argument in favor of professional minimalism. He went out to the cabin in the woods in Walden to try to figure out, okay, let's get down to the bare necessities I need to survive. I need shelter. I need food. I need warmth. And then how much does it cost? And he actually, this is down to the fraction of the cent. This is the first, maybe third of Walden's going down to a fraction of the cent. Like, okay, here's how much money I need to have the bare necessities of life. And it, for him, it worked out to be the equivalent of about one day per week of him renting out his labor was enough for him to, to live in the woods. And then that was his baseline. And he was arguing like, okay, everything after that is sort of optional. Now you're doing a trade-off. 
Now you're trading time to get some more money and now you have to start weighing off. Is it worth having this much more money? What's it going to do to my time? And when Thoreau was talking about the mass of men who leave lives of quiet desperation, he was talking about his fellow farmers in Concord, Massachusetts, and looking at how they were mortgaging more and more land because they could get their profits up. If every acre got you a dollar profit, then having 200 acres would give you $200 profit, but they're essentially sacrificing almost every discretionary minute of their time in exchange for this extra profit. And he was doing the calculus and saying, I don't think this trade-off makes sense. So, isn't I mean, there, isn't there a proverb or a story about the the guy like sitting in with a fish by his village and, then yeah. the, and, and the, the MBA student walks up to him and says, you know, if you only yeah. built this technology and developed these processes, you could five X your production. And he kept saying, but why would I want to do that? Yeah, like, but then you could be in charge you... of the company. Why would I want to do that? Then you can make a lot of money. Why would I want to do that? He's like, then you could retire to the, right, the water side of the lake and look yeah. at your fish. And he's like, yeah, but I'm already doing that. Right. Yeah. And yeah, Thoreau had a, his own version of that, which was like the farmer who was really proud of his wagon that cut down his trip into town to be, you know, 20 minutes instead of an hour because he didn't have to walk anymore to bring his produce in. But but Thoreau said, I did the math and you're working two extra hours a week to afford the whack. And so you actually ended up much worse off. Right, right. And then the physical declutter minimalism movement, what are sort of the contours of, of that phenomenon right now in America? Right. So so what makes Kondo, for example, a minimalist philosopher in her approach is that what, what she's essentially saying is, I get that all of these things in your closet have some value. There's a reason why you're holding on to this because maybe you might need it one day or you have some sort of sentimental attachment. But if you focus that down to the things that are really, really valuable to you, and she uses the terminology spark joy, and get rid of the things that aren't worthless but are just less value, you're getting it better off. The the clutter itself is costly and and the, the cost of the clutter is going to overwhelm the benefits that each of these things causing the clutter actually creates. And that's a classic application of minimalism. And now you can think about your phone like the closet in the Mary Kondo show, right? I mean, everything on there, you downloaded it for a reason or you signed up for it for a reason, but the clutter itself is costly for a lot of different reasons. And so, you know, clearing that out just to focus on the apps that spark joy, you know, as you would say, uh, that's classic minimalism. Well, and, the, and to be precise, the cost that we experience with our addiction to these devices and apps is that we're unable to produce, to use another phrase of yours, deep work, the sort of creative accomplishments that can make a legacy, can make our career, etc. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I assume it's it's being able to engage with a level of depth and with an attention span that lasts more than five minutes. Well, that's part of it, right? So in the professional sector, yes, right? That's what it's keeping you from. But in your life outside of work, it's also just keeping you from the fundamental activities that are crucial to human flourishing. Say more. Okay. So, I mean, part of the, the complaints that people are getting by having these proverbial digital closets be so so cluttered, right, is that the fundamental things we need, like investing time and attention into serious relationships with family, close friends, and community, crucial to thriving, having a thriving social life as a human being. People do a lot less of it because it's easier to, to do something on a social media channel. High quality analog leisure crucial to actually finding meaning and balance and buffered in a life that has lots of ups and downs you can't control a way as aristotle said to to actually sort of understand and enjoy intrinsic quality in the world even though maybe your situation in the moment is is something that's really difficult right it's a it's a, a buffer against nihilism and, and and existential despair that's really important you know time with your kids solitude the ability to actually be alone with your own thoughts which has a lot of benefits these are all things that are fundamental to human flourishing and the compulsive nature of what's on our phone is crowding that out. So that's the opportunity cost. That's great. Great clarification. So in, because you're right, in this book, you talk about the personal, your personal life. So there's, there's arguably a professional consequence yeah. as it relates to your ability to focus long enough to produce hard things. But in your personal life, you're really talking about this impacts happiness and a sense of meaning. It's crowding out time with friends, family, walks in the park, other things that have been shown to really uh, make us feel more full, uh, make us feel more whole. What are some of the uh, specific leisure activities? And I don't know if there's data around this or this anecdotal that we're doing much less of than we used to. Is this the old bowling alone? We're not going to the bowling leagues? We're not going to the bowling leagues, often, yeah. yeah. Well, well, real world conversation in general. So, so any sort of analog interaction, be it on the phone or FaceTime or in person, analog meaning that there's like a voice being exchanged back and forth. There's facial expressions to look at. You've sacrificed some time and attention for the interaction. I've come to see you and I'm spending my time being with you. When we do less of this, we get less happy, which is why you see these otherwise sort of confounding correlations between increased social media use and loneliness. 
Why is that happening? Almost certainly it's because the increased social media use is crowding out the real world interactions. But the real world interactions go a lot farther towards dissipating loneliness than the than the online interactions do. And so this social snacking effect is what psychologists call it, can itself be be problematic. And then solitude deprivation is another thing. It used to be unavoidable in the course of a normal day, there would just be moments when you're alone with your own thoughts. In line at the car, waiting to go down into the Montgomery BART station here, which seems to have quite a long line at rush hour, I've learned, right? You're just, okay, what can I do? I'm alone with my own thoughts. We've innovated the ability to banish that, which is a huge innovation. Never before in human history could we get rid of every moment of solitude in the day. But if you actually spend hundreds of billions of dollars to build a ubiquitous high-speed wireless internet network and give everyone supercomputers in their pocket that are hooked up the back-end servers with algorithmically optimized information feeds, like we can, for the first time in human history, kill every single moment that we might have to be alone with our own thoughts. And that's been problematic as well. So let's let's clarify your definition of solitude because it's it's really interesting. Many of us think that solitude is being physically alone. And so if you're on the uh, you know, if you're sitting in your bedroom alone, not talking to anybody, you're in solitude. But by this definition, the one you're talking about, if you're listening to a podcast, God forbid, and you're and you're sitting alone in your bedroom, you're not in solitude because I think your definition was a mind that's not intruded by the thoughts of other minds. Is that how? Yeah. So so if free from input generated from other minds. That's the definition of solitude. So if you're listening to something, reading yep. something, obviously in conversation with somebody, yep. you're not in solitude. Yeah. But if you let's say you're in a crowded subway, but there's nothing in your ears, you're just kind of looking around or just thinking that's solitude. Yeah, so physical proximity is not relevant. This definition, by the way, came from another book called Lead Yourself First, which was about how solitude intersects with leadership. So just to give credit where credit's due. And so what's so special about the state of solitude? What's what's happening in the mind or, or spirit that we should want more of? Well, th- there's two things that are important about it. So one, when you're processing input generated from another mind, there's a very particular neurological mode for your brain to be in. Right? This is something that we care a lot about as a species. And so if I'm going to be processing input that comes from another mind, it's all hands on deck from a neurological perspective. You have a lot of work going on in your brain. There's a lot of systems that are being fired up so that we can we can do this sort of vital activity. So if you're in that mode, you're, you're not in the other types of modes that are useful. So one of the things you lose when you're in that mode is you're not able to actually process and make sense of information very much. So it's important to listen to this podcast episode, for example. But if you want to extract the most value out of it, you also have to think about it. So right now, as you're listening to this, you're in the all hands on deck input processing mode. The proverbial processor in your brain is busy reading things off of the the hard drive. And so it can't do much else. So if you really want to get the insights, you have to have a, a, a later time where you're just thinking and you're bouncing around the ideas and you're thinking about it and you're running against your own existing mental schemas about how you understand the world and where does it fit and where does it conflict and what does that mean? And now you're going to actually extract insight. This is also uh, just thinking and being alone with your own thoughts is also where a lot of self-development and self-growth happens. So this was this was actually a, a big theme from that book, Lead Yourself First, it, talking about leaders who had moments of growth, you know, figuring out, okay, this is what I'm about, I'm going, this is important, the character development almost always came from long periods thinking and not an input processing mode. And then finally, there's almost certainly some sort of maintenance that comes in that requires you to be out of all hands on deck input processing mode. Your brain needs downtimes. It can't always be spinning up the the reading off the hard disk mode. And so if you get rid of that downtime, there's just neurological issues it probably causes, which most likely are manifesting as anxiety. It's interesting. Sometimes I find people need almost an excuse to be uh, reflecting and doing that deep thinking in solitude. So for example, sometimes uh, I'm reading a physical book or a Kindle, but I'm actually not reading. I'm sort of just staring at the pages, really I'm thinking. So in a sense, it might look like I'm reading and I might need that to be an appearance that others around me perceive so they don't try to talk to me. Uh, But really what I'm doing is I'm thinking. And actually I am in solitude in that moment because I'm not really processing the words on the page. But, you know, because there's sort of this funny tactical question with respect to solitude, you know, what are we talking about? Just like staring at the ceiling of your uh, bedroom or, you know, staring off into the distance. I mean, that can be a little socially awkward. Yeah. And so sometimes you need to have the appearance of distraction to give yourself the solitude. Does that make sense? Yeah. Which is something I had to learn, right? Because I, I came up training in the theory group at MIT where everyone was socially awkward and they did stare at the wall. <laughs> I think literally this was this was not an uncommon occurrence to see like a MacArthur Genius Grant winner staring at a whiteboard. You go to lunch, you come back, 
he's still staring at the same whiteboard you go and you do some work and they'll have a group of people around them just sort of waiting for the insights to happen. So solitude and thinking was very normalized in sort of my professional training. But you're right, when you're out there in the real world, it kind of freaks people out, right? When you're on the BART and just looking <laughs> just looking straight across at someone with your... Don't make eye contact. Don't make eye contact. Yeah. It's funny. One of our LPs here at Village Global, Mark Zuckerberg, is known for very, very long pauses in between answers and sometimes three, four, five minutes before answering a question and it's staring off into the distance, reflecting on what he wants to say. Yeah. And, you know, I think when you have a level of power and status, you can actually pull it off. But for, for those of us lesser mortals, sometimes we do need sort of the, the pretense of being occupied. Yeah. It, it, it upsets the Starbucks barista when you do that. <laughs> 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 what do you want to have that? What do you want to drink five minutes later? <laughs> yeah. And we're going to, I want to, I want to get back to the, your solution set uh, in digital minimalism, but just to further on this topic of, uh, of solitude, you know, the one thing you don't talk a lot about in the book, but you know, it's, a, it's something that I have done a lot of in recent years is mindfulness meditation. And the premise of mindfulness meditation is you are in solitude in terms of there aren't, there's no other input into your thought pattern. And you're being very attentive to what thoughts are occurring to yourself because sometimes people are in solitude and they're great. I now have, it's, it's just me, myself, and I in my mind. And I'm not listening to a podcast. I'm not reading. I'm not talking to people. But then a whole stream of anxious ideas and thoughts and memories sort of come to the surface. And sometimes you're not even aware of what's happening. You just, you're sort of staring off into the distance, 10 minutes of solitude, and then you find yourself sort of bummed out. And one of the metaphors that a teacher of mine once said is, uh, once taught was that if you can really be mindful, then when a thought arises, you can imagine that that thought is sort of knocking on the front door of your mind. And uh, maybe the thoughts, anxiety or jealousy or envy. And it's sort of saying, excuse me, can I come in and occupy your mind for a little bit? I just wanted to take up some room and, and make you a little more anxious. Yeah. And you can say, because you're aware, um, you can say, and eh, not today, like pass on through. Yeah. I, I won't invite you to tea today. The yeah. thought can just pass on through. But many of us need to have a, there's a sort of attention that's necessary in solitude to ensure that the thought patterns you're having are actually constructive because it's not so clear to me that for the average person, especially if you're in a sort of high stress job, that just unplugging and spending 20 minutes staring into space is going to lead to constructive or certainly positive uh, thoughts or ideas. Uh, how would you how would you react to that? Well, I think mindfulness meditation practitioners are much better at solitude. Uh, it's a little bit confusing because when you're actually in the middle of doing a mindfulness meditation session, you are in a state of solitude at that moment. It's a state of solitude, though, that's pretty specific. I mean, essentially, it, it can give you the, the maintenance mode type improvement because you're not processing inputs from other minds because you're specifically not trying to engage with thoughts. It doesn't touch on the other two benefits, which is actually having insight in the self-development or, or professional insight. But I think people who are practitioners of mindfulness meditation, for the reasons you talked about, are better at the other types of solitude. Because you can start sifting and sorting. You, you're very comfortable being alone with your own thoughts. But something that I've found talking to people about this book is that just as a first step, regularly getting 20 minutes when you're alone with your own thoughts is in itself really hard at first and you get better at it. And the easy way to do it, by the way, without it being socially weird is just take a situation where you would normally have earbuds in and just don't put them in. So it's when you're walking to X, when you're commuting, when you're you're going to the drugstore back, when you're walking the dog. So, so a time when you're already doing something else and that you would normally have earbuds in, you just don't put the earbuds in. Right. So the listenership to this podcast plummets after yeah. Mark this day, <laughs> Cal Newport yeah. arrives. And well, no, you need something to think about in your solitude. So yeah, you, you have to still listen to podcasts. That's sometimes. right. So, yeah. you, so you used to listen to this podcast, then spend the rest of the time reflecting on this podcast yeah. versus going to the end. Well, the as, as, but this was, so I, I dug this up in the book from Ben Franklin's journals during his first Atlantic crossing when he first went to London. And he, you know, he had this observation that the sages are kind of talking about the importance of solitude, but I would bet that if you gave them too much of this, they weren't going to be very happy. And and that's definitely true. So the, the idea of about solitude is you need some. It's like the sun. <laughs> you need some, but if you're always in a state of solitude, you're also going to be miserable and lonely. That's why solitary confinement is considered the worst thing you could you could do to someone who's imprisoned, right? So 20 minutes here, 20 minutes there. And then beyond that, you can be listening to things and doing things. It goes a long way. So I mean, just getting used to having any time alone with your thoughts, people already get improvement over time. It's weird and scary at first, and all they're doing is writing emails in their head. But even without a formal inward facing cognitive practice like mindfulness meditation, even just regularly doing this, they get a little bit better at picking up a train of thought and working with it or, or observing what's going on. However, if you do a regular mindfulness meditation practice, you're probably going to be really good 
at extracting value out of time alone with your thoughts? I think it's a great challenge for everyone listening. And this goes for walking down the street and putting earbuds in, going into the bathroom and bringing your phone and refreshing Twitter, walking down a hallway. I, I, you know, I worked at Lincoln for a couple of years and uh, I have to admit that I was once in the bathroom using the urinal and I decided to multitask. And I said, well, I'll catch up on email um, while I'm taking care of nature's call. The SVP of product at the time, Deep Nishar, who's now at SoftBank, pulled up in the, in the urinal next to me. And he said, Ben, um, life's too short. <laughs> um, you don't need to be checking uh, yeah. your phone right now. Yeah. And I'd like to think that I was trying to be productive. Right? I'm trying to be efficient. I'm trying to multitask. I think there's a darker reality for many of us that avoid solitude at all costs, which is dark truths about the nature of our life and the nature of reality will surface. Yeah. You know, this life will end. My life might not have a lot of meaning. I might not be super happy at my job. Yeah. I might not have a great relationship with my parents. Yeah. I might not have as many friends as I would like or whatever the whatever the reality is that we're trying to avoid, we distract ourselves from that reality. And ultimately, I think the, it gives those negative thoughts more power. Like part of what they teach in mindfulness meditation is when you observe something carefully, you defang it in a yeah. way. You just notice it. And most of all, you notice it's impermanence. You might have a little anxiety now. You might have a little bit of anger about someone in your life who's annoying to you, but that anger will dissipate. It will not last forever. And that, in a sense, is a source of optimism, right? Feelings of envy and jealousy won't last forever, but you have to notice that they're there and then notice that they go away. And that can almost give you the confidence, in a sense, it's sort of spiritual confidence to have solitude and say, yeah, come at me, come at me with whatever you got. You yeah. know, I, I'm not going to try to lock up the monsters in the in the closet of the bedroom come out and uh, scream in my ears if you want, because I know you're you're not permanent. Yeah. But I do think there's a the solitude business, there's something much deeper going on oh, yeah. that I think people are, it's an avoidant tendency, right? Oh, it's definitely pacifying, which is really problematic. Yeah. When you, when you don't confront what's distasteful or what's uncomfortable. I mean, there's a reason why it's distasteful or uncomfortable. That means it's a problem. And so if you don't confront it, if you, if you want to try to uh, escape from it, I mean, this also fuels the cycle of addictive use. I mean, this is this is kind of the source of a lot of addictive behavior is put aside the 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 substance or the actual uh, interactions it's having with your dopamine system. You know, something that really does feel addictive behavior is this is how you deal with something hard, which is why you know Johan Harari talks about like in England, if you get a hip replacement, they give you heroin. I mean, they call it something else, but essentially the painkiller you get in the National Health Service is is heroin, and yet you don't have all these old ladies, as he says, becoming heroin addicts, even though they're getting a lot of heroin, right? So why do some people become heroin addicts? Well, there also has to be some component of this is an escape from something I'm trying to avoid, right? That really then becomes a strong association. So if you're, yeah, if you're escaping something hard by looking at your phone, you're playing with dangerous forces. You're playing with these type of self-reinforcing cycles that's going to make it harder and harder to get away from this and make it feel more and more uncomfortable when you do. And we know so the, the Eastern perspective is the one of impermanence, right? You, you can't understand the impermanence of a hardship in life until you actually confront it. And then it, it de defangs the impermanence. You have in sort of the more modern Western tradition also this sort of like Nietzschean idea that, yeah, this stuff is hard. But the right thing to do is to face it and to figure out what you're going to do about it. And actually, that foundation of taking responsibility for your actions is the foundation for, you know, flourishing as well. So so let's talk about sort of your practical advice in the book, because you paint a, you know, a fairly depressing picture of how um, our use of, of, of social media technology today can be corrupting our minds and uh, distracting us from activities and pursuits that are ultimately more, more fulfilling. And then you describe in the book uh, a set of experiments that you've run with your readers to get them to digitally declutter for 30 days to see, to see how, it, how it works. So your advice is you don't have to go cold turkey overnight forever. It's not about deleting your Facebook account and never using it again for the rest of your life. You're suggesting people take 30 days to stop using these tools and technologies, see how it feels, see what you miss, see what you don't miss, and then slowly add back into your life um, the tools and technologies that you think are beneficial in concert with your value system. So maybe we can talk a little bit more about first establishing a set of values in your, in your life. And what are some example values? And we've talked over the years in our own friendship about 
your own personal values and how you revisit them quarterly. I'd be love to hear some specific ideas you have for what values are, are worthy today. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it's all personal to each person. But so you start with a set of values, you unplug from the technology for 30 days, and then you slowly add back in the technology in a way that's super intentional and conscious. Start, starting over, basically. Start it over. Yeah. So say, so say more about how that process will work. Yeah. It's like with Mary Kondo, right? The idea is not just, you know, over time, you maybe take something out of your closet and then another day say, yeah, maybe I don't need this. Or what she says is, no, you clean out the whole thing and then you rebuild it from scratch with the stuff that really matters so that's essentially what i'm saying we need to do we're leaving this initial 10-year period of exuberance around all these technologies being new and novel the sort of experimental phase now it's time to clean out the proverbial closet rebuild your personal digital life from scratch but just do it much more intentionally now the reason why i say 30 days as opposed to just do this over a weekend or something like that is actually it's the values is the tricky part Because what I found when I was talking to people about this is for a lot of people, they don't have an answer to the question of what do I actually want to spend my time doing outside of work? Like, what am I about? What's important to me? What do I want to be doing? A lot of people don't have an answer to those questions. And so this is a big part of the 30-day piece of this idea is that's enough time to be away from the noise of the screens to actually start experimenting, reflecting, and figure that out which is why I have this gap that you don't see in other types of uh, decluttering procedures. And I have to say, it's unusual for me in my style of writing to have something that's sort of as baldly self-helpy as a 30-day anything, right? I mean, it sort of sounds like a diet book. It's not the type of thing I would typically write, but I just kept finding when I was working on this problem is that that's what was needed. Before we get, I want to hear about some of the specific ideas you have for ways that you can fill up your leisure time, your newfound leisure time with all the time you're currently spent on Instagram. Oh my God, you have all this time. What do I do with it? Yeah. Um, so you have some some specific ideas we should talk about. But first, let me understand the word values. So what are you saying? Are you saying that each of us in our own life should have five to seven values that are what each of are we talking about values like integrity and responsibility? Or are we talking about life priorities like family and friendships or or what do we mean by values? Right. Well, they're connected. So so in order to actually make the sort of decisions for a digital minimalist overhaul, you need an answer to the somewhat lower level question of how do I want to spend my time outside of work? Now, that's going to be based on deep values, right? Integrity, family, religious values, whatever it is, there's going to be something deeper down core values on which you probably are basing these, these questions of this is what I want to do with my time. This is what's important. But it's that sort of secondary question of this is this is what I think is the best things for me to be doing with my time outside of work. The answers to those questions is what allows you to make much smarter decisions about your tech. But let me just push on that a bit. And we know because you've been an, a friend and an ally for going all the way back predating the Startup Review. You know, and the book that I co-authored, the Startup Review, we, we acknowledge this idea that a lot of people don't know what they want to do in life. They actually don't know themselves very well, especially younger people. Yeah. Um, and in our book, The Alliance, we talk about how the company's mission statement will always be clearer than the employee's personal mission. We talk about the need to for company and employee to align. What does the employee want in life? What does the company want in business? And then you have as much overlap as you can to develop a productive tour of duty. The problem is, is the company always has a clear mission statement. And the employee is like, well, I don't know. Maybe I want to be here for 10 years, two years. Maybe I want to live in Asia. Maybe I want to live here. I'm interested in marketing. I'm interested in technology. I don't know. Yeah. And so for people who are uncertain about what really matters to them or what their ultimate aspiration or dream job is. This is, by the way, I often take issue with advice that's given to young people on the way you build a successful career is, and we've talked about this for forever, you know, start with the end in mind of what the dream job is, then to simply work backwards. I wish it were that simple. For some people like Bill Clinton and, and others, uh, Lyndon Johnson, other folks who often have become some of the most powerful people in history, they had that aspiration from age nine and they could just pursue it unwaveringly. But for those of us who are a bit more at sea, perhaps we have too many interests that conflict. Is it so clear as to articulate a, oh, boom, this is how I should be, how I should be spending my extra hours now yeah. that I'm not using technology? Well, well, that's in part why there's 30 days. <laughs> so, sorry, that's enough time to get... to get 30 and, days to figure it all out. 30 days to figure it all out. And then <laughs> two, and, and, and I learned this working on the book, how important it is to emphasize to people, especially young people, no one's carving this in the stone on day 31. Right. So 30 days is enough to get some answers. And then you go back and you do it again and again and again. Right. And so for a lot of people, especially young people, it's the first time they thought about this at all, at all. Right. Which is why it can't be over a weekend. Right. They, they need at least a few weeks to get some, we can call them preliminary answers to the question of what am I all about? Hopefully that puts you in the habit of continuing to return to those questions, continuing starting to think about them. There's a virtuous cycle here where 
you have a tentative answer to this is what I'm all about. And so now you're using tech much more intentionally. You're almost certainly now going to, you know, one of the things you care about might have you spending more time reflecting that reflecting is going to help you clarify your values and, and you, you, you get this type of virtuous cycle, but you have to put a stake in the ground somewhere. What I worry about with 30 days is I don't think it's enough time. I think it's just enough time for people to realize they don't have good answers to these questions. That's important. It, it, it is important. But now you've jacked up anxiety without actually having a game plan on what to do about it. So, you know, the sad truth, and you've put your finger on this in a very eloquent way in this book, which is people, by main, keeping so busy, by being so occupied, they are able to push to the margins of their thought stream these deeper uncertainties they have about life. What do I really care about? What am I passionate about? Why doesn't my daddy love me enough? Et cetera. If you create the space to contemplate those questions, but you do so in a somewhat undirected way and without enough time to really unpack it all, I worry you've opened Pandora's box to start mixing metaphors, but then you, ha you don't have the time to sort of have a plan around it. So is it better? Is, is, is 30 days enough or should it really be like six months or a year? And I realize we're trying to be practical here. Yeah, no, that, that's going to paralyze people. Right? If you say we're going to spend six months or a year because you're going to get this you're going to get this fully straight. In some sense, I think that's going to be worse. Like, so here's what happens. Like, here's a typical case where someone who's young, saying, let me go through this process. Like, where are they going to land at 30 days? It's going to be some combination of my friends and family are really important and I want to, I want to be, be there for them and of service to them. Uh, a lot of people, maybe community, right? Like, uh, there's certain communities in their life that are very important. I want to be of service to that. I want to support that. That's important. A lot of people have some sort of physical health type value that comes up. This is very common, right? It's, I, I want to be healthy or, uh, you know, X, Y, Z. And then maybe sometimes people have a, a particular type of leisure type activity that's important to them. And they'll say, this is, this is something I want to spend my time on. So they have this preliminary answer. Coming out of this 30 days now, they're, they've They'll completely re-engineer their life so that uh, they're using tech in strategic ways that helps those things, but they're spending much less time just mindlessly looking at the screen and much more time doing some subset of those activities. Now, that's a huge win. Now, they're get already getting much more value out of their life. Tech has become much more instrumental in their life. They're not escaping things as much. They're taking on responsibility and going after things that seem valuable to them. That intentionality alone is incredibly valuable. Now, over time, now you're in an intentional mindset. Well, now you're thinking about these type of things and you're going to start to, you're going to start to revise this and start to, you know, go deeper at some point. The fact that, you know, my dad never loved me or something like this. Like maybe eventually you're going to get the bottom of that when trying to understand what's happening X, Y, Z. You reach out to your dad and you schedule you, the meeting and once out, and for yeah. all you clear the air. But, but, but <laughs> in, intentionality in general is what, what the real, what the real value is. And so this is what people come up with at first. And like these things are actually very valuable. I mean, so most people land at some combination of those four or five things as at their first swipe through this. So practically speaking, you've observed in some of the feedback you've gotten from the book that's been out now about a month that people are sometimes wondering, how do I spend this extra time? So they've, they've done the digital decluttering. Um, you're not a fan of detox, right? Yeah. So de de digital decluttering. Yeah. And they've stopped using Instagram. And I, and I mentioned earlier, I haven't used Instagram in the year 2019. So I stopped at, it actually began, I was in Vietnam and Taiwan over New Year's. I logged into to Instagram on January 1st. And I saw all of these people I follow post all of these exotic photos of like Four Seasons Bogota, Four Seasons Mexico City, Four Seasons Hawaii. And now maybe I'm following the wrong set of people in their exotic vacations. Now, sure enough, I was at a not un nice hotel in Taipei. So yeah. I was in a, certainly an exotic place too. But I'm just sort of scrolling through this thinking, I'm just seeing these highlights from people's lives and it's making me feel like crap unnecessarily so i have a lot to be grateful for i am in asia now with people i love yeah. and care about i should be loving this moment not thinking about the four seasons hawaii looks pretty looks nice, really nice. <laughs> <laughs> so i uh, i said you know what i'm gonna just take a break from instagram it was inducing too much fomo now i have a lot of interests and a lot of other ways that i can spend time so i was not hurting for what do i do with my extra time but for some folks there really is this sense of okay i've got an hour uh, a day now at night when I'm normally just screwing around on my phone before I go into bed, uh, what do I do with that time? And so what are some specific things that you've seen people take up that have, that contribute to a, a happier, more fulfilling life? Right. And, and and more fundamentally, I think this is what's important of the bottom up approach versus the top down. So if the approach is just, ah, I don't like Instagram, I'm going to stop using it. Now you have to face the, what am I going to do with my time versus the the clutter approach, which is let me figure out what I want to do. And now I'm rebuilding my life around that, that positive answer. So, so what, what do people do? You see a lot more in-person interaction enter into their life, usually structured and planned. 
Like I do this with these friends. We do a game night with these people every single week. I call every one of my siblings every week. Like this day I call this person, this, this day I call this people. You see a lot more joining community organizations that are important, like getting involved and, and sacrificing time and attention to the organizations, groups, or communities that you think are important. You see a lot of fitness and other sort of high quality leisure activities gets into it. You know, maybe people spend more time walking or running. Maybe they spend more time, you know, cooking is a big thing. Knitting comes up a lot. Reading books, actual conversation with spouses, like much more of that going on. So the type of things you might you might expect. Complex hobbies come into it. There's a lot of makers I ran into, for example, working on the book. So you see these type of things. But when they start, this is why starting with, I'm pretty sure this is what I want to do, or at least I feel like these type of activities that I've identified during this 30-day period resonate with me. Starting from that is really going to be much more successful than starting from what don't I like about my digital life? Let me try to get rid of it. So in close, maybe we can just sort of preview the next book that that you're working on. And it's about the domain of life that we haven't talked a lot about in this episode, which is work life. Uh, Many of us who are listening to this uh, are on Slack. We're on IM, iMessage. We're chatting with people. We're getting emails from coworkers all day long. And it's very hard to actually be maximally productive when we live in this interrupt culture. And uh, it's all shallow work. It's not deep work. And it does impact our happiness and our productivity. And we ought to probably use our devices less, even in a work context. I know that's outside the scope of digital minimalism, but uh, you've been thinking a lot about this. And it's it's the next book in, in, your, in your series of, uh, of, of works here. So can you give us a preview of what you're thinking about there and some stuff for us to look forward to? Right. So this, this new book, which is tentatively titled A World Without Email, is uh, essentially making the argument that at the moment, we're pretty bad at knowledge work. And the reason is, is because we're not acknowledging how human brains actually function. So in knowledge work, the the prime capital resource is really the human brains that are employed by the organization. It's human brains that can take an information, think about it, produce new information that has added value. Like, that's the fundamental alchemy of producing value in knowledge work. What we've done is we've evolved in a sort of emergent, unintentional fashion, a workflow that most knowledge work organizations use, which is based off of continual, unstructured, ongoing conversation. So through email or Slack or SMS or some combination of tools, we just all can talk to everyone and we'll have this ongoing, unstructured conversation. We'll figure things out on the fly. Like, hey, can you grab this? What's going on with this? Can you hop on the phone? Like, we'll just, we'll just have this hyperactive hive mind. We'll figure things out on the fly, which was very convenient, very flexible. But the problem is, is that it directly conflicts with the psychology and neuroscience of how you actually get human brains to produce value with it. And so needing to constantly help along and contribute to this ongoing conversation makes it very, very difficult for you to also use your brain to take in information, think about it, and produce new information with value. And so the idea I'm working on for this book is that we need to fundamentally rework this underlying workflow. If I can, what 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 percentage of us actually produce deep work in our day-to-day life like what percentage you're you're a computer scientist you actually have to solve deep complex problems problem sets etc many of us are communicators the venture capital job is an often oftentimes shallow work in the sense of just making introductions and you're acting to stuff and you're communicating with team members there's episodic deep dives of cognitive work but what percentage of the economy? I mean, is this a bias you have? I mean, academia, certainly it's 95% deep work. Is this, am I underestimating just how much uh, the other knowledge workers need that that sense of solitude and ability to go deep as you as in academia needs? Well, so with this book, I, I see value production more broad than just intense, deep concentration. But you know, fundamentally in knowledge work, when we get down to it, there's brains that add value to information. And then there's administrative and management and other types of things. But fundamentally, the key resource that actually generates the return, the thing that directly produces things that is of value, so therefore brings back excess value to the corporation or organization, is minds thinking about things and producing value. And so, I mean, I think we need to step back and think, what's the best way to set up an environment that that makes minds as good as possible at doing that and is as sustainable as possible so those minds are happy and fulfilled uh, and not burning out? So I think it's probably... The hyperactive hive mind is affecting a much bigger fraction of the workforce than you might imagine. Cal Newport, New York Times bestselling author, Digital Minimalism, Choosing a Focused Life in a Noisy World, a great read. Thank you for uh, joining us on the Village Global Podcast. Of course. Thanks, Ben. If 
you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Please hit us up at villageglobal.vc slash network catalyst.